Okay, interesting. So he thinks he has control. So does that make it more tragic or less tragic than if he has a choice? I have a question. How do you make someone feel stupid? Well, for rising horror auteur Ari Aster, the answer is simple. Foreshadowing. Hint at the destination long before you reach it and make it so that when you finally do, the audience feels dumb for not seeing it earlier. But don't stop there. If you're Ari Aster, the foreshadowing serves an even deeper purpose. Throughout Hereditary, he combines foreshadowing with large, complicated plots to contribute to the film's themes, creating feelings of powerlessness, isolation, and claustrophobia. And he does this in a variety of ways, subtly relaxing you until it's too late to escape. Even as early as the opening shot, Aster introduces us to the idea of inevitability, to the lack of agency the characters have in the story, a concept that underlies the entire film and becomes impossible to ignore by the climax. The shot presents a treehouse framed within a window, like it's a canvas or photograph. The end of the film brings more context to this treehouse, illustrating its importance as payment takes over Peter's body. Framing the treehouse within the window makes it feel more restricted, confined by some external force. Trapped. And this isn't the only example. Hereditary creates many smaller frames on the screen to confine its characters, whether it be with windows, walls, poles, or doorways. Oh, there's so many doorways. Hereditary uses this restrictive framing to visualize and intertwine the ideas of control and fate, implying some correlation or causation between the two. That not only do these characters have no control over their lives, symbolized through their restrictive framing, but that this lack of control will lead to some inescapable fate. The first shot visualizes this idea, suggesting that this location is and will be important, that it has been secured, that this is where the story is destined to conclude and nothing can stop it. Even the camera itself acts as a barrier on the characters, yet another frame that traps them and reinforces the idea that they are destined to travel a particular path. We see the clearest example of this when Annie talks about her family's tragic history at the support group. During this monologue, the camera slowly moves in on her, trapping her, visualizing how the events that she's talking about have been restricting her, how her mother has been pushing her and her family down an inescapable path, an idea that becomes more clear throughout the story. I didn't feel like a mother, but she pressured me. When Annie sees her mother's apparition, she turns on the light and it disappears. However, it then cuts to a long shot of Annie from where the apparition was, creating a feeling that she's still being watched but simply can't see the observer, a microcosm of the film's main conflict. By now, everyone knows about the cult symbol seen throughout the film, whether it be on the walls of their house, or in Joan's apartment, or on the pole that kills Charlie. But there are other visualizations and clues of the family's entrapment. We see a letter from Annie's mother that illustrates the plans that have already been set into motion, using language that suggests only one possible outcome. Much of the horror in Hereditary comes from the influence of the antagonists, from the idea that they had planned out every action of the lead characters, and these visual hints build even further on the themes of fate and inevitability. Whether or not the characters understood or even saw them, they were always there, guiding them without their knowledge. The plans had already been irreversibly set into motion, and Aster continues to pound this idea into our heads over the course of the film. Even before the opening shot, the very first thing we see in the film is an obituary, familiarizing us with the idea of death and its inevitability from the very beginning of the film. Even the title, Hereditary, insinuates some predestination, some condition that has been assigned to a person against their will. Fate. Predetermined. He references time throughout the film as well, alluding to its incessant approach, how it constantly looms over the characters, that they are running out of it. He does this with the deadlines on Annie's miniatures that people keep reminding her of. So what's our deadline now? Seven months? Six and a half. Ooh, coming up. And more subtly through Charlie's repeated clicks that sound like the ticks of a clock. Tick. Tock. You are running out of time. Your destiny awaits. 
Aster incorporates interesting backstory as well that not only adds depth and complexity to the characters but also further illustrates the inescapable plans others have for the Graham family that, no matter what they do, will always come to fruition. We learn that Annie used to sleepwalk and almost killed herself, Charlie, and Peter. Though she had no control over her actions, she still would have been the cause of their deaths, an unwilling agent of their fates. In her dream with Peter, she says that no matter what she did to have a miscarriage, it didn't work. I tried to have a miscarriage. How? However I could, I did everything they told me not to do, but it didn't work. It doesn't matter what she wants. Peter was destined to come. Then why did you have me? It wasn't my fault. I tried to stop it. Her life is not her own. Aster shoots the confessions of this scene in profile view, which detaches us from the characters, keeping us from seeing their full faces and emotions. The film uses several lateral tracking shots and other smooth and human camera movements to create a feeling of an omniscient rather than subjective point of view as we look at the family. We become observers rather than empathizers, like we're simply watching these tragic events unfold, unable to do anything, further isolating the characters and adding to the helplessness and inevitability the film has been building. Aster creates a similar effect through the characters' actions as well. Joan encroaches on Annie's space with her hands, visualizing how she's been invading and influencing her life. Charlie and Annie both sleep in the treehouse where they'll eventually find themselves permanently changed, beheaded, and surrounded by cultists. Even Peter tries to sleep there in a deleted scene. It's like they're being drawn to the film's climax, to their ultimate fates, bringing even more weight to the treehouse, to the opening shot. Aster also makes use of illusion, most notably when Peter's class talks about Heracles and the idea of fate. Having the characters within a film talk about fate and how the characters in the story they're discussing have no control is like breaking the fourth wall, because they too are characters within a story who ultimately have no control over their actions. Now, some might say that having characters literally discuss the themes of a film is too obvious and lacks subtlety, and usually I'd agree, but doing so in Hereditary only makes its themes even more powerful. Ironic, really. Even with clues, even given hints, even when it's right in front of their faces, told to them in class, they still can't stop their fates. If it's all just inevitable, then that means that the characters had no hope. They never had hope because they're all just like hopeless, they're all like pawns in this horrible, hopeless machine. And this idea is personified even further by the confines of the film itself. Not only have they been trapped within the webs of the cult, but they've also been trapped within the frames of the film, doomed to experience the fates planned out for them by the filmmakers, bringing even more weight to shots like the camera trapping Annie during her group meeting. Even the film's borders have become a force of oppression, another layer shaping their lives. Which brings us back to the opening question. So does that make it more tragic or less tragic than if he has a choice? Less. Okay, why? Because. Thanks for watching.